in the south of Thailand, cradled by the sea and concealed by lush mangrove forests, lies our Pang Nga. This stunning 400 square kilometer bay is a world unto itself, sculpted by relentless tides, where towering limestone cliffs rise from emerald waters and ancient caves whisper tales of the past. Nestled along the southern coastline of Pang Nga province, roughly between Phuket and Krabi, this hidden pearl's vast splendor is best appreciated from the sky or by exploring its waters. Join us as we navigate through this enchanting seascape, uncovering the wonders that make Pang Nga Bay one of Thailand's most captivating destinations. This region, known for its unique geological formations and rich biodiversity, has been the subject of significant ecological and cultural interest, and the first part of our tour takes us through dense mangrove forests. The bay's ecosystem features shallow marine waters, intertidal forested wetlands, and these mangrove forests, which host at least 28 identified species. Mangroves are uniquely adapted to thrive in brackish water environments, where freshwater and seawater mix. Their survival in these challenging conditions is due to several specialized traits. To manage high salinity, many mangrove species have salt excreting glands on their leaves or roots, allowing them to expel excess salt. Others, like the red mangrove, feature aerial roots called pneumatophores that extend above the water, facilitating oxygen exchange in oxygen-poor soils. For our tour, we use a distinctive vessel known as a long-tail boat. This unique boat is powered by a truck engine connected to a propeller via a long shaft, which gives it its name. The design allows the boat to navigate through shallow and obstructed waters, such as those filled with floating debris or water hyacinths. The long shaft can be lifted out of the water to clear the propeller if it becomes tangled. Although this setup is highly functional, it tends to be quite noisy. As the boat glides through the water, we are enveloped by the awe-inspiring cast mountain limestone cliffs that define this landscape. We notice the dramatic peaks and deep caves etched into these towering formations, which have been shaped over millions of years. Composed primarily of calcium carbonate, these cliffs have been sculpted by the relentless action of rainwater. Slightly acidic from dissolved carbon dioxide, the rainwater has gradually dissolved the limestone, creating the striking features we see today. Boats in the bay are dwarfed by the sheer size of the towering cliffs that surround us. On the port side, another long-tail boat swiftly overtakes us, apparently in a hurry. Its propeller at the tail end sprays water up like a fountain as it speeds past. Pang Nga Bay's ecosystem is home to 42 islands, each shaped by the complex tectonic forces that define the region's geological history. The collision of tectonic plates led to the uplifting and folding of sedimentary rocks like limestone, giving rise to the dramatic karst formations we see today. These formations bear a striking resemblance to those found in Ha Long Bay, northern Vietnam, both in appearance and the processes that created them. In a moment of paradolia, the phenomenon of seeing shapes or patterns in nature, I see a gorilla in the shape of the mountain on the starboard side. 
However, upon reconsideration, it could just as easily be a mammoth. Paradolia, after all, is not an exact science. Since 1981, a large portion of Panga Bay has been designated as a national park, underscoring its environmental significance. Besides being famous for its dramatic limestone cliffs, which shelter caves and collapsed cave systems, it also features archaeological sites, such as cave paintings, offering insights into the region's prehistoric past. Approximately 10,000 years ago, during a period of lower sea levels, it was reputedly possible to walk from Phuket to Krabi. Though in Thai, the name Panga translates to a broken tusk, or the tusks of a female elephant, the name is believed to originate from the Malay word Pangan, meaning heathen, pagan, primitive people, or as a proper noun. Referring to the Pangan, tribes or people traditionally inhabiting the jungles of the Malay Peninsula and its islands. The area's name was officially changed to Panga in 1824 when Siamese forces under King Rama III expelled Burmese invaders, suggesting that the region was historically inhabited by indigenous peoples, likely the Orang Asli or other Aboriginal groups. In 2002, Panga Bay Marine National Park was designated a Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention. In southern Thailand, especially along the coast, you'll find a specialized version of the long-tailed boat known as the Ruhua Thorn, or the boat with a lifted head. This variant, with its high prow, is designed specifically for coastal navigation. Commonly seen throughout the southern Andaman Sea, these boats dot the waters around Phuket, Pangar, Krabi, Ranong, Trang, and Saktu. Originally from Krabi province, the Huathong boat was first used for local fishing but has since evolved into a versatile vessel for both livelihood and leisure, including tourism. Its distinctive high prow is tailored to handle the challenging waters of the Andaman Sea, providing better stability against strong waves and preventing water from entering the boat. Long-tailed boats are commonly used by the Chow Lei, once nomadic sea gypsies who have a long history in southern Thailand and are believed to be among the first settlers in many of the Andaman Sea's islands. Ethically distinct from southern Thais, the Chow Lei have their own language and customs. Fishing has long been the cornerstone of their livelihood, but modern changes and loss of fishing grounds due to development have increasingly strained their way of life and cultural traditions. Embraced as a cultural icon, the Huathong boat not only serves as a reliable means of transportation but also plays a significant role in promoting tourism in the southern provinces. Many of these boats are adorned with vibrant motifs that reflect the region's rich heritage. For comparison, this is a standard long-tail boat with a more conventional design. During the full moons of the 6th and 11th months in the lunar calendar, the Chow Lei hold a ceremony to bring prosperity and happiness for the coming year. They construct a two-meter wooden boat, fill it with mementos, and perform a dance before setting it adrift. We have now arrived at our first stop, Ko Kao Ping Kan, famously known as James Bond Island. This island gained international fame after appearing in the 1974 James Bond film The Man with the Golden Gun, 
where it served as the hideout of the villain Francisco Scaramanga, played by Christopher Lee, an assassin known for his signature weapon, a solid gold pistol. A highlight of the island is the iconic limestone rock formation, Kotapu, or Crab Eye Island, famous for its distinctive, spiked shape. On this side, the island is marked by mooring buoys to prevent vessels from entering, preserving the scenery and ensuring the safety of potential swimmers. Consequently, all visitors must disembark from either the side or the back of the island, where you'll also find the National Park's ticket booth. <laughs> The freestanding rock formation Kotapu rises prominently about 20 meters above sea level in the northern bay of Kokau Pingkan. On the horizon, the floating village of Kopanyi comes into view, our next destination, which we'll explore in more detail shortly. When I first visited James Bond Island some 30 years ago, it was still a hidden gem, far from the bustling tourist paths. Back then, the island featured a modest thatched hut where seashells were sold and a natural trail that allowed for a serene exploration of the surroundings. Over the years, however, James Bond Island has transformed from this tranquil retreat into a popular tourist attraction. The initial changes began with the construction of an elevated boat landing on the northwestern side of the island, designed to accommodate the increasing number of visitors. This structure, however, was later removed to make way for further developments, significant changes continued as the southern end of the main beach was converted into a concrete wharf, effectively halving the natural beach. The northern portion of the beach was similarly modified, the original sandy expanse was divided, with half remaining as the beach and the other half being elevated with concrete. This area now features a newly built staircase that leads to viewpoints offering panoramic views of the surrounding bay. Additionally, the northwestern beach still serves as an anchorage point for boats to this day. These developments reflect the island's evolution from a serene, off-the-beaten-path destination to a well-frequented tourist spot, accommodating both the growth in visitor numbers and the need for enhanced infrastructure. In Thai, the word tapu means both crab-eye and nail, which are indeed similar in appearance. Its base measures roughly 4 meters in diameter, expanding to about 8 meters at the top. Geologically, Kotapu is a remnant of a Permian period barrier reef. Tectonic shifts fractured the reef, scattering its fragments across the region, which were later submerged by rising seas. Over time, wind, waves, and tides have sculpted these limestone formations with tidal erosion particularly visible at the rock's base. <laughs> Kokau Pinkan, while not very large, has become a victim of its own success. Despite the trail being widened and fitted with observation platforms to enhance the visitor experience, the island is prone to overcrowding during the high season. Often, the boat wharf becomes so congested that long queues form, leading to significant waiting times to board and disembark. It is therefore advised to visit the island outside of the high season and as early as possible in the day to avoid the crowds and long waits. Khao Ping Khan, the name of the main island, means mountains leaning against each other. 
This refers to the its unique limestone cliff, which appears to have split into two, with the collapsed side leaning against the other. Adjacent to this is a small open-sided cave that opens out to the sea and features several sinkholes. Natural columns seem to support the roof, evoking the feeling of being in a setting straight out of the flintstones. The leaning cliffside of Kaoping can feature several stone plaques with engraved signatures, commemorating visits by various dignitaries, including King Pumipon and Queen Sirikit. These markers serve as a record of their presence on the island, highlighting its significance as a destination worthy of royal attention. On the cliffside, there are several small caverns that are inaccessible to the general public, with a warning sign cautioning visitors about the potential risk of rock collapses. With the renewal of the island's infrastructure, much of it, including the ticket office and toilets, has been cleverly integrated into the natural surroundings, blending seamlessly as if camouflaged. Back on the southern side, we wait for our boat to take us to our next destination. Part of the landing area is sheltered by an overhanging cliff, offering waiting passengers protection from the elements, such as sun or rain. Empty boats, with only the driver aboard, anchor and wait while their passengers explore the island. They keep clear of the wharf to avoid obstructing arriving or departing traffic. As we head towards our next destination, we pass boats arriving from Kopanyi, the stilted fishing village we're about to visit. We notice several other boats heading in the same direction. The rise in tourism has led to the development of various seafood restaurants and souvenir stalls on the island, making it a popular stop on Panga Bay tours, often serving as a lunchtime destination. The larger boats anchored on the port side bring tourists seeking an adventure in sea kayaking allowing them to navigate serene waters and tackle challenging waves. This sport offers a unique way to explore coastlines, rivers, lagoons, and caverns, providing both tranquility and excitement in sheltered areas. However, in open waters or strong winds, it can become a demanding test of skill and endurance. Established in the late 18th century by Javanese Muslim sea gypsies due to land ownership restrictions, Kopanyi is renowned for its distinctive construction on stilts over the sea, set against the backdrop of a towering cliff. The village, known in Javanese as Pulo Panji, is home to approximately 360 families, totaling around 1,600 people. These residents are descendants of two seafaring Muslim families from Java, in Indonesia. Due to Thai land ownership laws that restrict ownership to Thai nationals, the settlers originally built their village on stilts within the island's protective bay, facilitating easy access for fishing. As tourism in Thailand grew, the community thrived and was eventually able to purchase land on the island. This led to the construction of notable structures, including a mosque and a freshwater well. The mosque on the island serves as a central gathering place for the predominantly Muslim community. Additionally, the village market provides essential goods such as medicine, clothing, and toiletries sourced from the mainland. As the entire population of Kopanyi is Muslim, there are no dogs or pigs in the village. Instead, villagers keep birds and cats as pets. One man even has an eagle, which he allows tourists to photograph for a fee. In the southern provinces, many people also keep birds to participate in regular bird singing contests, 
particularly featuring red-whiskered bulbuls, the caged birds we saw earlier in the video and which are also popular pets. In these contests, the birds compete to showcase the most beautiful song and voice. The contests usually consist of three rounds, with a panel of experts evaluating and judging the performances. Floating rafts with breeding nets are located just offshore, while residents have the convenience of mooring their boats directly at their homes. During low tide, villagers take advantage of the exposed mudflats to construct structures that will eventually be submerged. This allows them to build foundations that are later covered by the rising tide. While there are some grocery stores that serve mostly residents, there are also numerous souvenir shops catering to tourists. The village also features a Muslim school that serves both boys and girls in the mornings. It has several playgrounds and sport fields, including a floating football pitch. The Thai educational system comprises two years of kindergarten, Anuban, six years of primary school, Pat Tom, and six years of high school, divided into three years each of junior high, Matiom Tun, and senior high, Matiom Plari. Compulsory education includes the first six years of primary school and the first three years of junior high. Higher education includes colleges, Moha Wit Hyalai, and universities, with degrees such as bachelor's, Perinia Tree, master's, Perinia Toe, and doctorate, Perinia Ek. Uniforms are mandatory for students in lower grades and often in higher grades, with teachers also required to wear uniforms on Mondays. The modern Thai education system was significantly influenced by Prince Damrong, a son of King Rama IV. Despite adequate curricula, teaching standards are generally poor. Over 80% of teachers struggle with their subjects, and nearly 95% of secondary school directors fail in English and technology. Corruption and cheating are widespread, with students sometimes buying their way through school or engaging in dishonest practices. This, combined with inadequate parental oversight, results in many students joining the workforce unprepared. Due to the informal nature of this education, many boys attend boarding schools elsewhere. A man has successfully caught a large fish using a self-made harpoon. It is an impressive Asian sea base, also known as Barramundi and with the binomial name Lates Calcarifa. Native to the Indo-West Pacific region, spanning from South Asia to Papua New Guinea and Northern Australia, this versatile fish is highly valued in both commercial fisheries and aquaculture for its rapid growth, adaptability, and mild, flavorful flesh. The Asian sea base is easily recognizable by its streamlined silver body, dark olive green upper parts, and slightly flattened head with a large mouth. As a skilled predator, it thrives in both freshwater and saltwater environments, inhabiting rivers, estuaries, and coastal areas where it preys on smaller fish, crustaceans, and insects. Revered in various Asian cultures, particularly in Thailand and India, the Asian sea base symbolizes prosperity and is often featured in celebratory dishes. Its delicate, sweet flavor and firm texture make it a favorite for grilling, frying, steaming, and baking. As word spreads, neighbors gather, expressing their admiration for the remarkable catch. A scale is fetched, and as the man weighs his prize, it's revealed that the fish tips the scales at an impressive 12 kilograms.
Inside, its mouth is lined with fine, bony structures called pharyngeal teeth. These structures help the fish grip and manipulate prey, preventing it from escaping once captured. The bony ridges in its mouth enhance its efficiency as a predator, enabling the Asian sea base to feed on a variety of smaller fish, crustaceans, and insects. The mudflats beneath the village are teeming with life. I spot mud crabs, fiddler crabs, goby fish, and mudskippers, semi-amphibious creatures that spend most of their lives on land, using their fins and tails to move across the flats. They can breathe out of water thanks to a special cavity behind their ears that stores seawater, allowing them to reoxygenate their gills when on land. In keeping with Islamic tradition, which avoids the depiction of living beings to prevent idolatry, home interiors often feature Arabic calligraphy. This includes verses from the Quran and other meaningful texts, beautifully designed to enhance the space. Here, a black redstart, a passerine bird not native to Thailand and not commonly found in captivity here. There are only a few narrow paths on the island, and locals primarily use bicycles or walking as their main modes of transportation. Thailand has approximately 2,900 mosques, with the largest being the Patani Central Mosque. Most mosques in the country feature distinctive Islamic architecture, including arched gables known as Maksura. Adjacent to the mosque is a cemetery, called Makbara, in Arabic, which derives from the Arabic word Kaaba, meaning grave, and is associated with the word Makabra. Islamic law mandates that the body be buried as soon as possible after death, ideally on the same day, without a coffin, and with the head facing Mecca. Muslim graves are often left nameless or marked only with simple markers, reflecting the belief that all souls are equal in death. The minaret is used for the call to prayer, while inside the mosque, the mirab indicates the Qibla towards Mecca, and the adjacent minbar serves as a raised platform for delivering sermons. As I make my way back to the boat wharf, I pass through a network of small alleys lined with various stalls selling souvenirs. The narrow passageways are packed with vendors offering a range of products, including handcrafted items, textiles, local artwork, and especially pearls and objects made from seashells. In the water beneath the houses, I spot several stripe-nosed half-beaks. Their name comes from their distinctive jaw structure, the lower jaw is long and spear-like, while the upper jaw is somewhat shorter. This arrangement allows the fish to feed efficiently on floating debris, particularly fallen insects. Notably, there is a distinctive black line running along the center of the upper jaw, and a pale spot on the tip of the lower jaw that seems to glow in the water, reminiscent of a fluorescent, yellowish-green, 
felt-tipped marker. This spot may be effective in attracting insects, their main source of food. The mantis shrimp, despite its name, is not a true shrimp, but a large marine crustacean resembling both a praying mantis and a shrimp. It is categorized into two types, spearers, which use barbed appendages to stab prey, and smashers, which have a club-like appendage capable of striking with bullet-like force to break shells. Horseshoe crabs can go a year without eating, swim upside down, can endure extreme temperatures and salinity, have 10 eyes, and can see UV light, while some extracts of their blue, copper-based blood are used in medicine. Several water tubs at the seafood restaurant are filled with a variety of live fish, crabs, and crustaceans, ensuring customers receive the freshest food possible. As we board for the final leg of our journey, we take one last look at the village and its impressive surroundings. As the icing on the cake, a Brahmini kite performs a dramatic dive, expertly adjusting its angle just before hitting the water. It plunges feet first, then quickly lifts off, regaining speed and altitude while securely holding the fish it has caught. Several boats are maneuvering around the wharf, creating a bit of a standoff that delays our driver's departure. Then it's our turn to move, and our boat swiftly gains speed as we pass the floating village taking in the view of the mosque's golden, onion-shaped domes. As I watch the mosque glide by, I reflect on the remarkable achievements of these once nomadic sea gypsies and am impressed by their success in such a challenging environment. As we start our journey back from the islands, the boat moves away from the open sea and into the intricate network of mangrove deltas. We pass by towering limestone mountains, their shapes shifting with our changing perspective as we glide past. The transition is marked by a gradual change in scenery. Overhead, a lone white-bellied sea eagle ventures into the territory of some Brahmini kites. Despite its size and status as one of Southeast Asia's largest raptors, the sea eagle is aggressively attacked by one of the smaller kites without hesitation. As we approach the mangroves, we notice just how shallow the water must be in this area. Though less prevalent than in Vietnam's Mekong Delta, this area also has occasional clusters of nipa or mangrove palms, a palm species that thrives in the soft mud of coastal wetlands near brackish and saltwater areas of estuaries, but away from wave action. It lacks a visible stem, can grow well over 3 meters, and its feather-like pinnate leaves emerge directly from the soil. They are used for thatching, and when harvesting, at least three stalks should be left intact at the base of the plant to prevent it from dying and to ensure a future harvest. Besides this, the plant's inflorescence can be tapped before it blooms to yield a sweet sap, which is used to make alcohol, referred to as palm vinegar. Its fruit consists of a cluster of woody nuts compressed into a large ball that grows upward on a single stalk. When ripe, the nuts detach from the cluster and float away on the tide, occasionally germinating while still waterborne. 
This fruit cluster is sometimes called water coconut and can be made into a refreshing drink. The nipa palm has a very high sap yield, rich in sugar. When fermented into ethanol, the sap can produce up to 20,000 liters of fuel per hectare, three times as much as sugarcane and almost ten times the yield from corn. In Myanmar, the buoyant stems are used for training swimmers.